Don't call me while I'm on a business trip. I'm busy with work. But I had no choice. It was an urgent matter. I then relayed Ashley's message, but Tom still seemed irritated. After we finished talking, he suddenly yelled at me in a harsh tone. From now on, don't call me while I'm on a business trip, no matter what. Got it? He didn't have to yell at me like that. Is something going on? Still, I couldn't understand why he was being so harsh just because I tried to reach him a few times. After thinking it over for a bit, I decided to just play along and said, Fine, I won't call you no matter what happens. However, I soon understood why Tom had told me not to contact him while he was on a business trip. The reason became clear after the major accident he caused while pretending to be on a business trip. As I learned more about the cause of the accident, I realized that my decision to follow Tom's orders and not reach out at all had played a part in what unfolded. My name is Laura Cooper, and I'm a 45-year-old housewife who has been married for 20 years. My son, George, just graduated from high school and started living on his own while attending college out of state. Now that my parenting days are behind me, I decided it's time to return to the workforce. I applied for a full-time administrative job that was available and recently started working as a full-time employee. While I had worked part-time before, being a full-time employee gives a different sense of purpose in life. My husband, Tom, works for a large corporation and was recently promoted to department head. At 45, the same age as me, this promotion seems to be an unusually fast climb within his company. Lately, Tom has been traveling a lot for business meetings with other companies, so he's hardly ever home. Tom is very enthusiastic about how fortunate he is to have so much work, even in this tough economy. Even though Tom's salary has increased, I'm determined to work hard too, especially for George, who's attending a private college. Because of this, my husband and I have been passing each other more often, and we rely on our smartphones when urgent matters come up. Tom isn't really a fan of phone calls, but sometimes he doesn't have a choice. Actually, our family has been living in a guest house built on his parents' property. Tom's parents, Ashley and Bill, are really nice people, and they don't interfere with our lives much. We only see them occasionally. That said, there are times when they ask for advice, like about property taxes, and in those cases, I have to get in touch with Tom. Today, I had something urgent come up while Tom was on a business trip, so I called him, but no matter how many times I ride, he didn't pick up, and he didn't call me back either. Since it wasn't anything too urgent, I decided to wait until the evening. It was only late at night when Tom finally called me back. Hey, why did you keep calling me nonstop today? What was so important? I'm busy with work. Stop calling me. Well, Ashley asked me to take care of something, so I have no choice. If the ringing is bothering you, why don't you just put your phone on silent during those times? I then relayed Ashley's message, but Tom still seemed irritated. After we finished talking, he suddenly yelled at me in a harsh tone. 
From now on, don't call me while I'm on a business trip, no matter what. Got it? But what am I supposed to do if it's urgent? Even if it's urgent, there's nothing I can do if I'm away, right? So don't call me, ever. I'm not responding even if you did. He didn't have to yell at me like that. Is something going on? Still, I couldn't understand why he was being so harsh just because I tried to reach him a few times. After thinking it over for a bit, I decided to just play along and said, Fine, I won't call you no matter what happens. Without waiting for his response, I hung up the phone. The next moment, I got a message from George. It's so late, what could he want at this hour? When I opened the message, I couldn't believe what I was reading. George is currently at a soccer camp with his college team, staying at a resort hotel. There, he served Tom. When George was about to call out to him, Tom walked into a room arm in arm with a woman George didn't recognize. George asked the hotel staff, and they told him that the room was for two people and had a private jacuzzi inside. It sounded like a room that couples would book for a secret getaway. Could Tom be pretending to be on a business trip and doing something he shouldn't? As if confirming my suspicion, the last line of George's message read, Dad's cheating, there's no doubt about it. So Tom was lying about being on a business trip. That's why he didn't want me to contact him, he was with his mistress. I know where George's soccer camp is. It's in a tourist area way off the beaten path, definitely not somewhere you'd go for a business trip. It's a beautiful place full of nature, with wide fields, which is why the college soccer team uses it for training camps. Tom must have thought he wouldn't get caught if he didn't say anything. But he never imagined that George would be there at the same time. Tom has been so wrapped up in work that he's left almost all of George is upbringing to me. He probably doesn't even know that George is good enough to be on an elite soccer team. I replied to George, asking him to let me know if he found out anything more. The next day, since it was Saturday and I had the day off, I was at home when, starting in the early afternoon, my phone began ringing non-stop. Every call was from Tom's phone. After all his complaints about me calling yesterday, what's going on? I hesitated for a moment, wondering whether to answer. Then I remembered the promise I made yesterday. Tom had insisted I never contact him while he's on a business trip, and I told him I wouldn't, no matter what. So I figured that even if he was the one calling me, I didn't need to respond. Normally, it would be impossible to ignore dozens of calls like this, but if Tom is off on a romantic trip with his mistress while telling me not to contact him, there's no way I'm answering. But the phone kept ringing non-stop. Could he have gotten into some kind of trouble with his mistress? If that's the case, he wouldn't be calling me his wife. However, I started to worry a little, so I checked my phone screen. Then I noticed a single missed call from George, so I called him back right away. What he told me left me completely shocked once again. It was another unbelievable situation. Mom, something terrible happened. This morning, Dad drove off a 16-foot cliff and was taken away in an ambulance. What? What do you mean? 
everything went black before my eyes. But I noticed that Tom's phone had been ringing constantly. George continued explaining, and what he told me was even more shocking than the accident itself. Luckily, he fell into a pond, so the impact wasn't too bad, and he seems to be okay. But there was someone else in the car with him. It was the woman he stayed with last night. In other words, Tom had an accident while driving with his mistress. I asked George how something like this could happen, especially since Tom is usually a good driver, and what he told me was unbelievable. Since there was no soccer practice that day, George had been out running around the hotel with his teammates that morning. That's when a man showed up, shouting a woman's name as he rushed into the hotel. George went to check on what was going on, and to his shock, the man was the husband of Tom's mistress. When the man found Tom and the woman, he went into a rage, screaming, Give me back my wife. A panicked Tom grabbed the woman by the arm, pulled her outside, and quickly drove off. But as they were driving on the mountain road, still within view of the hotel, Tom couldn't handle the curve, and they plunged off the cliff into the pond below. The constant calls from Tom's phone could mean that he's conscious and trying to let me know he's been taken to the hospital, or maybe someone nearby is calling on his behalf. I asked George if he knew which hospital Tom had been taken to, but it seemed he didn't have that information. If George had told the hotel staff it was his father, they might have given him more details. But considering that the person in the car with his dad was Tom's mistress, it was probably hard for George to explain the situation. I told George that once the hospital identified him, they'd likely call us, and I hung up the phone. At some point, the calls from Tom's phone had stopped. I decided to just wait for the hospital to contact me. As I had expected, a call came in from the hospital later that evening. Just like George said, Tom was safe, and his life wasn't in any danger. I asked about the person who had been in the car with him, as there had been someone else involved in the accident. However, they refused to answer my questions. I kept pressing, but they insisted it was private information and couldn't be shared. It was likely that Tom had asked them not to tell his family about the other person. The hospital requested that I come the next day to take care of the admission paperwork and bring any essentials Tom might need even though there was a chance I'd run into the mistress, I had no choice but to go and handle the paperwork. So, I reluctantly agreed to go to the hospital the next day. But that night, I received another message from George, and it made my skin crawl. George had gone to visit a teammate who had been injured during practice and hospitalized three days ago, but by chance, Tom was in the room next door. George realized this because Tom's voice was so loud while he was on the phone that he couldn't help but overhear. Apparently, Tom was talking to his mistress, who was also hospitalized, and the conversation was so embarrassing that George said he was turning red just listening to it. Unable to bear it any longer, George quietly left the hospital, making sure Tom didn't notice he was there. Just hearing this story made me want to walk away from the whole situation. As I was thinking that, a message from Tom came through, 
Hey, why aren't you answering the phone? I got into a car accident while on a business trip and I'm in the hospital. You know that because the hospital contacted you, right? I was out in the countryside, so the hospital is far away. But make sure you bring everything I need for my stay tomorrow. What a one-sided message. Well, if I don't go handle the paperwork, it'll cause trouble for the hospital. Just as I was thinking it was getting late and I should go to bed, an unknown number called. Fu could be calling at this hour. Feeling suspicious, I let the call go to voicemail to see if they'd leave a message. A man's voice came on. I'm so sorry for calling at such a late hour. Could this have something to do with the accident? I decided to answer the phone. The man introduced himself as Steve, and to my shock, he was the husband of Tom's mistress. According to him, he had hired a private investigator to look into his wife, Emma, and her affair partner, Tom. The investigator had even uncovered our phone number. I'm truly sorry for the trouble my wife, Emma has caused you, Laura. I don't even know how to begin apologizing. Even though he was a victim himself, Steve kept apologizing repeatedly. His polite manner made me feel a little embarrassed. No, we're both in a difficult situation, so please don't be sorry. After I said that, he seemed relieved and began explaining the details the investigator had uncovered. It turned out that Tom and Emma had met through social media. Although Emma was 42, she looked at least 10 years younger and used her beauty to attract attention from men. Meanwhile, Tom, who was a rising star in a major corporation, had been posting sharp-looking photos of himself and interacting with many female users. The two of them began to take notice of each other and eventually met in person. That was three years ago. Steve had discovered the affair a year ago, and since then, Emma had been going on more overnight business trips. Come to think of it, Tom's business trips had increased around that time, as well. Steve, who loved his wife, had agonized over the situation. But no matter how much he fought about it, he couldn't figure out how to handle it on his own, so he hired a private investigator. And that's how this affair and their secret trip came to light. It turns out that the reason Steve was able to confront them at the hotel was because he had placed a GPS tracker on Emma's belongings to follow her. Both Emma and Tom were taken to the same hospital after the accident, but they were admitted to different floors. Thanks to the airbags, they only suffered minor scrapes on their upper bodies but they both hit their legs hard and are now in casts. Because of that, they can't visit each other in person. So that's why Tom was talking to Emma over the phone. Steve had already gone to the hospital and requested to meet with Tom, but Tom refused, so the hospital denied his request. I just want to put an end to this somehow but I can't even talk to Tom. What am I supposed to do? Steve sounded desperate, and I felt a bit lost about how to help him. Then I remembered George's message from earlier. Not knowing if it would work, I came up with an idea and shared it with Steve. That's a great idea. Steve said, sounding relieved. He thanked me and ended the call. If everything went well, 
This would give Tom a taste of his own medicine for lying to me. The next morning, I called George and asked him to help with the plan I had come up with. Later that day, just before noon, I received a message from Tom. Hey, why aren't you coming to the hospital? I didn't even buy any toiletries because I thought you'd bring them. I haven't brushed my teeth. And you need to come do the admission paperwork, too. The nurse has been asking if you're coming, and she's still waiting. I read the message, but didn't reply. Instead of responding to Tom's complaints, I sent him a certain video. Tom saw the video and immediately responded, clearly furious. What the hell is this video? Why are you sending me something like this? It was the audio recording George had helped me capture of Tom and Emma talking on the phone, which I had then turned into a video using a photo app. What I had asked George to do earlier was to get his teammate, who was in the room next to Tom's, to secretly record Tom's embarrassing phone conversation on his smartphone. That teammate, Jake, is the same age as George, and apparently, they're on good terms. So when George explained the situation, Jake gladly agreed to help. Jake recorded the video, sent it to George, and then George sent it to me. That's how I was able to send the video to Tom. Tom probably never imagined his affair would be exposed in such a way. I can picture his nervous, flustered expression right now. As I continued ignoring Tom's messages, a new, angrier one arrived. And now what? Might have just called me. He was furious, yelling, were you on some kind of affair trip? Laura, you ratted me out to him, didn't you? Yes, I had sent a video to Bill's phone as well, along with a message explaining everything from the affair trip to the accident. After seeing that, Bill must have immediately called Tom. Bill is a strict man who despises any behavior that strays from proper morals. If he knows Tom was cheating, he definitely won't let it slide. Just as I was thinking that, I heard a car horn outside the house. Bill was ready to rush to the hospital to confront Tom, and Ashley was sitting in the back seat. Come on, Laura, hop in. Let's go to the hospital together. I got into the front passenger seat and helped navigate as Bill drove us to the hospital. On the way, I decided to contact Steve. He didn't answer, likely because he was at work, but a short while later, I received a text message from the number I had called. It contained a video. In the video, Steve was addressing Tom directly in a recorded message asking me to send it to Tom. Since he couldn't meet with Tom in person, this was his way of reaching out. So, I forwarded Steve's video to Tom. Just as I was wondering why Tom hadn't replied yet, I got a call from George. Now that I think about it, it's lunchtime. Mom, something crazy just happened. I'm at the hospital checking on Jake, but he heard the voice in the video dad was watching on his phone, and Jake stormed out of the room, even though his leg isn't fully healed yet. It turns out the voice Jake heard was his own dad's. What? I couldn't believe the coincidence. Hearing that left me in complete shock. So, Tom's mistress is Jake's mom. What should I do? Jake's got dad by the collar and is yelling at him. When I went to check it out, dad yelled at me, are you in on this with Laura, too? I understand, I'm heading over there now, just hang tight. 
the situation had taken such an unexpected turn that my mind almost went into panic mode. But I quickly calmed myself down and texted Steve to update him on what was happening. Apparently, Steve hadn't known that Jake was in the hospital, as Jake hadn't contacted him. Since the school handled the hospital admission after Jake's injury at soccer camp, it was up to Jake to inform his family. It seems Jake didn't want to worry his parents, so he kept it to himself. After hearing what happened, Steve said he would rush over, even if it meant leaving work early. Meanwhile, Tom must be in a terrible position right now. Because this was the content of the voice message I had sent him earlier from Steve. Tom, I'm going to file a claim for damages against you for having an affair with my wife, Emma, for the past three years. I'll also be reporting this to your company. On top of that, Tom now had his affair partner's son grabbing him by the collar and berating him. As expected, Tom left me a voicemail on my phone this time. Help me! I'm stuck here, and this big young guy is going to crush me. Shut up, old geezer. Behind Tom's voice, I could hear what was clearly Jake's voice, sounding furious. Listening to that voicemail, I couldn't help but think it served him right, and I chuckled to myself quietly. Still, thinking about how Jake must feel, discovering that his own mother had been having an affair with his friend's father, made my heart ache. I was sure Steve was feeling just as heartbroken as I was. With those complicated emotions, we finally arrived at the hospital. Steve was already there, waiting at the entrance. I'll head upstairs to see Emma first. You go on ahead. With that, he went to the floor where Emma was admitted. When Ashley, Bill, and I reached Tom's hospital room, there was already a crowd. Other patients had heard the commotion and gathered to see what was going on. Trying to push down my embarrassment, I entered the room. Tom was still pinned by Jake, who had him by the collar. When Tom saw me, he glared angrily. Why did you come so late? Now hurry up and get this guy off me. Shut up. I'm not moving until you apologize. Jake, his face contorted with rage, tightened his grip on Tom's collar. His leg was still wrapped in bandages. It must have taken everything he had to get to this room. I could only imagine the pain he felt, knowing his mother had been taken from him in such a way. Look. Just calm down and listen to me. I knew Emma was married, but I didn't know she had a kid. Dad, this isn't the time for excuses. Just apologize already. If you don't, Jake's injury might get worse. That's right, Tom. Besides, even if she didn't have kids, that doesn't make it okay to be with a married woman. Tom, cornered on all sides, was now completely isolated. He looked around frantically, searching for help. But all he got were cold stares from the other patients watching from the doorway. Then, from a distance, we heard the sound of critches approaching. It seemed to be Emma. Steve must have told her what was going on and she couldn't stay away any longer. Hey, wait a minute. I could hear Steve's voice coming from behind her as well. However, the sound of the critches grew closer, as if Emma was trying to ignore him. As soon as Emma entered the room, a look of shock appeared on her face. 
After all, her son Jake was on top of her affair partner. Jake turned to her, his eyes filled with sadness. Mom, why this guy? And I heard it's been going on for three years. That means it started when I was still in high school. You're always out working, leaving dad to take care of everything at home. I never imagined you were having an affair. Tears began to roll down his cheeks as he spoke. Their situation was the complete opposite of ours. Even so, Jake must have still loved his mother. The feeling of betrayal must have been unimaginable. Emma, seeing her son like this, could only stand there, flustered. Calm down, Jake. You've injured your leg, haven't you? If you keep doing this, it'll get worse. I'll find you a better hospital, and we can go there together. Her words sounded like an attempt to flee the situation, and everyone around her looked on in disbelief. It was clear Emma had no idea what would actually make Jake feel better. And then, there was someone else completely misreading the room, saying the most outrageous things. Wait a second, Jake Wright, I thought I recognized you. I just saw you in the paper recently. You're a college soccer player, and the pros are keeping an eye on you, right? I saw your name alongside George's and read every word of that article. You know, if I end up with your mom, we could both bring in good money. We'd be able to support George and you in everything you do. That's right. Steve is just running a failing shop. Basically a stay-at-home husband. He's a money pit. If we're going to invest in Jake's future, it'd be better for me to marry Tom. Same goes for us. Laura's only been making a little pocket money with her part-time work. So maybe it'd be better for George and Jake if I ended up with them instead. What on earth are these two thinking? I was the one for raised George to where he is today. Tom, who barely cared about our family, didn't even know how hard George had been working until he saw his name in the newspaper. No matter what happens, even if we get divorced, I'm not letting Tom take George from me. As if voicing my own farts, Steve suddenly spoke up. Shut up, both of you. I've taken care of everything at home so Emma could work without any worries. I've handled all the household chores and raised Jake myself. Parents' days, sports activities, everything. And even though the shop wasn't slow, I still found time for it all. I've watched Jake chase that soccer ball every single day, working so hard. Do you even understand how that feels, Emma? Steve's desperate words left Tom and Emma in stunned silence. I felt a sense of relief, like Steve had said everything I'd been thinking. I stood up, ready to shut down the two of them. That's right, you two don't deserve to call yourselves parents. If you want a divorce, go ahead but don't drag the boys into it. They've worked hard while you both acted selfishly. Yeah, even if my parents get divorced, I'm not going with you, Dad. You call Mom a burden, but that's not true. She raised me and made things work on your salary, and when my sports got expensive, she went out and got a part-time job. I've seen her struggle more than anyone, George's words brought tears to my eyes. I thought George hadn't noticed, but he's been watching me all along. Behind me, Ashley and Bill nodded in agreement. Even the other patients in the room looked at me with calm, supportive expressions. But Emma, seemingly unable to take the pressure, suddenly let out a shrill scream. No way, I can't take this anymore. 
It's like I'm being blamed for working so hard all these years. Jake, you're on my side, right? I work day and night to pay for your education so you could focus on soccer. Even now, Emma was still trying to justify herself. Had she already forgotten her own actions? Jake glared at her, his own mother, with a look that spoke of deep disappointment. You're not my mother anymore. Go run off with this guy you've been cheating with. My tuition. Most of it came from dad's business profits. You probably don't know this, but the shop has been doing really well. So stop acting all high and mighty. You've just been wasting money on yourself. Damn you. Jake's words left Emma completely deflated. After three years of cheating, it was no surprise he accused her of spending money frivolously. With a look of resignation, Emma fell silent. At that moment, Bill, who had been quietly watching everything unfold, sighed and spoke up. Well, given the situation, it seems there's no other choice but for you all to separate. Tom, if you're getting a divorce, you need to leave our property. I can't allow someone who behaves so disgracefully to stay in this house. Tom's face went pale. What? Why? When people get divorced, the wife usually leaves. I'm supposed to inherit this place. If I leave, what happens to the family? I'll marry Emma and take over the house, so don't make me go. Tom pleaded with Bill, looking at him with desperation. But Bill had clearly fought ahead. The true heir to the family would be George. George, who was now attending a college far away, likely wouldn't return after graduation. However, the guest house would remain as a place where he could always return. The house would be put in George's name, and I, as his mother, would continue living in the guest house as I always have. Tom looked at Bill in disbelief, as if wanting to argue. The prestigious Cooper family had been around for generations. It was clear Foe as the most suitable to inherit it. Bill looked at Tom with an expression that said he hadn't raised his son to be like this. As a father, it's only natural to want your son to carry on the family name. But after Tom's shameful actions, he no longer had that right. For Bill, it must have been deeply disappointing. The faint glimmer of tears in his eyes reflected his feelings all too clearly. Sensing that the conversation on our side was over, Steve turned to Emma and said, We're getting divorced too. I'll take custody of Jake. I hate to say this, but you're not going to be able to stay at your cart job, Emma. And it's not just you. Tom is going to be out of a job too. What? Here's why they won't be able to stay at their companies. The car accident caused by Tom was photographed by a witness, and the pictures spread on social media that very day. Tom and Emma, too absorbed in their affair, hadn't realized this. Since their faces weren't blurred out, People from both companies recognized them, and it soon became known that they were on an affair trip. Especially Emma's co-workers, many of whom knew Steve, who ran a popular cafe in town, quickly realized that the man with her wasn't Steve. Similarly, some of Tom's co-workers had visited our home before and knew what I looked like. So. When they saw an unfamiliar woman with Tom at the tourist spot, they realized she was the mistress. Both Tom and Emma worked for prestigious companies with strict regulations. 
if it became known that they had lied about a business trip to cover up their affair, they were bound to face some form of disciplinary action. After Steve finished explaining this, Tom and Emma looked completely defeated, as if they knew it was all over. These two were likely about to lose both their families and their jobs. Even so, I still planned to sue them for damages. I was sure Steve would do the same. A little while later, Tom and Emma were discharged from the hospital, but they no longer had a home to return to. In Tom's case, if it had only been the affair, a demotion might have sufficed. However, it was discovered that he had embezzled company funds by pretending to be on a business trip and used the money to pay for the affair. It's no surprise he got fired. It's almost funny, Tom was even complaining about it on social media. After paying both me and Steve damages and spending a fortune on Emma, Tom ended up broke. Emma cut ties with Tom after losing both her money and her home, and reportedly returned to her parents' house. However, I received a message from Steve. And here's what he told me. Emma was also demoted to a rural branch because her affair trip had been exposed. But having only known life in the city, Emma refused to comply. As a result, she faced increasing hostility at work and eventually had no choice but to quit Emma's parents were confused about why their once promising daughter had left her job and pressed her for answers when she returned home. Under pressure, Emma confessed to the affair and was immediately kicked out of her parents' house. Emma's family had a strong reputation, and infidelity was something they could never accept. Their situation was made clear on Tom's social media account. After losing his home, Tom moved into a shabby apartment and eventually reconnected with Emma, and the two began living together. But with both of them unemployed, they were forced to rely on shady lenders to get by. Neither had any experience managing money, so they quickly fell into debt, spending recklessly and adding to their financial woes. Eventually, Tom's social media stopped updating altogether. It's likely they couldn't even afford their phone bills anymore. The phrase they deserve no sympathy seems to be tailor-made for these two. Four years have passed since then, George and Jake, after graduating from college, both joined professional teams that had been scouting them. Today is their debut match. I went to the stadium early with Ashley and Bill. Our seats were in the seventh row, close enough to see the players' faces clearly. When the players came out, George seemed to notice me and looked over with a smile. It was a moment of pure joy, something not everyone gets to experience, and it's hard to put into words how happy I felt. As the game started, I noticed Steve in the front row, watching the match intently. It was clear he had put his heart and soul into raising Jake. The two of them, expected to make an immediate impact, were given a chance to play midway through the game. George had grown into such an impressive young man. Overwhelmed with emotion, I couldn't stop the tears from flowing. Steve let out a triumphant roar when Jake scored a goal. This kind of emotional reward only comes from truly dedicating yourself to your children. 
I may not be the most perfect mother. However, every moment I've spent with George has been an irreplaceable treasure. And now, as I watch George standing on this grand stage, I feel an immense sense of pride as his parent. I believe that is what the true bond between parent and child is all about. In this moment, and for all the moments to come,